<laughs> All right, so. Lovely. <clears throat> okay, so we'll turn our minds to Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Now everything is settled here. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama zambodasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama zambodasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama zambodasa. What hung Saranang Gatami Damang Saranang Gatami Sankang Saranang Gatami Jotiampi Bot hung Saranang Gatami Totiambi damang saranang gachami. Totiambi sankang saranang gachami. Tatiambi bodhang saranang gachami. Tatiambi damang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sankang saranang gachami. Anatipata veramani sikapadang samayami. Adinadana veramani sikapadang samayami. Kame sumi chachara, where am I? The kapatang samadhi ami. Musawada, where am I? The kapatang samadhi ami. Sura maya maja hamadatana. Where am I? Sikapatang samadhi ami. Anjumayang Brahma Vihara Paranang Karo Masi. Ahang Sukito Huni. Niduko homi, Aviro homi, Avaya Pajo homi, Anigo homi, Suki Atanang Pari Harami, Save Sata Sukita Hundu, Save Sata Avira Hundu. Sabe Sata Abaya Panja Hondu Sabe Sata Aniga Hondu Sabe Sata Sukiatanang Pari Arandu Sabe Sata Samadukta Pamuchandu Same Sata Lata Sambati Toma with a Chandu Same Sata Kamasaka Kamadayada Kamayoni Kamabandu Kamapati Sarana Yang Kamang Karisanti Kalyanangwa Papakangwa Asadayada Bawesandi Thank you. So um I think the four right efforts is a really pleasing list because it's beautifully simple 
and it kind of encompasses the whole path. If you could just manage to do these, then you'd go an awfully long way. And um, there are like things like that that feels simple and they're in a list and they kind of cover everything. Uh, the four right efforts are part of the 37 factors of awakening. So they're part of a bigger group, which has things like the um, factors of enlightenment in it and the basis of success and the faculties and the powers. Um, and they're really, I suppose you could see them as a kind of an expansion of right effort as is um, on the Eightfold Path list. So um, they're broken down into the first one is basically to restrain oneself so that unwholesome states don't arise. And then um, the second one is that should unwholesome states be present, that one makes the effort to abandon those states. And then the third one is that one puts in the effort to cultivate wholesome states. And the fourth one is that if you have got wholesome states, basically you manage to maintain them. So you can see there's a bit of a pattern there and um, they could split quite nicely into two pairs. The first two dealing with unwholesome states of mind and the second two dealing with wholesome states of mind. Um, and I think it's worth as well at the beginning just considering what we mean by right effort. So not um, over straining but putting in that kind of effort which I guess is intelligent based on mindfulness and investigation and which is sustainable and doesn't leave you feeling um, kind of resentful and um, disheartened. So it's partly why I wanted to do that um, spreading the Brahma Vihara's chant at the beginning because it's all very much to do with having those efforts but also with the um, Brahma Vihara's as part and parcel of them really. So um, the first one as in restraint of the senses um, you could see it. So this is restraining oneself, one's mind, so that unwholesome states don't arise. And sometimes people talk about um, guarding the doors of the senses, that first contact that we have with um, the outside world or our inner world of thoughts. And it's really at that point we can quite often see kind of warning signs and um, it's where it's really useful to get to know our particular habits. You know, we get to know um, as time goes on, if we spend too much time, say, listening to the news, it will start to bring up um, maybe aversion. Or if we spend too long browsing on Amazon, it might bring up too much attachment. So there's certain um, behaviours that we start to notice don't really have a very good effect, which is all part of that kind of investigation work, which is really important. And that willingness really to look and try out different things, you know, not just to go the same old way, because we know if we go the same old way, we'll get the same old thing. Um, so mindfulness is really essential at this point, that you're awake and you can see the effects that things can form you, you can kind of see, say, warning signs. And that could include, you know, things like the company that you keep, and the things that you choose to do, they're all um, a kind of food, really, that will affect one. And just taking some care over that, because one thing leads to another. Um, but often these things don't happen all in one go. They happen actually quite gradually. And so you can kind of stop at different points and think, actually, no, I'm going to stop that input that's having you know, a, a, a bad effect. And then the second one, in some ways, might be easier because when you know you've got an unwholesome state, you've got something you can work to let go of or turn away from. At least you know it's there, but then it's probably the knowing and then the action to um, leave that state, which is the tricky bit because um, 
unwholesome states have a tendency to take us over and we can even be quite attached to them because they're familiar quite often <clears throat> and often they give a bit of a short-term pleasure so there's a kind of gratification with them which um, can be quite appealing so for example especially um, attachment type states so you know, a, a big one for me could be surfing on Amazon you know just love it <laughs> can spend a long time reading reviews looking at prices thinking about different things entering this whole world of possibilities um, and it's noticing when these kind of activities are actually reinforcing habits you know making them actually stronger um, you know and or whether they're under control and actually they're just uh, performing a function in your life which is um, fairly harmless because uh, it's not as if we have to have no pleasure at all um, but when you when you can tell so what do we mean by an unwholesome state we mean really um, a state of mind which is based on one of the one of the defilements such as attachment aversion ignorance pride or jealousy and probably those first three are good ones to uh, concentrate on really because they're quite clear and they're sort of three broad areas of attachment, aversion and ignorance. So um, these states have a tendency to kind of hijack us, you know, as I say, it's like we go into a kind of a, a dream world of shopping or running through loads of aversion lines you know maybe someone said something to you or someone's irritated you or someone's cut you up while you were driving and then you get into a whole story of hate really or irritation which has got <clears throat> aversion there at the root at some point and i think it's a little bit like when you go off in trains of thought and meditate at some point you kind of wake up and this happens more and more quickly as you develop mindfulness in your life and and um, a habit of investigating with a sense of humor and lightness and kindness to yourself. You start to think, you start to notice more quickly, ah, right, I've got a bit lost here. And as I say, it's the same kind of noticing that we have in the practice, actually, when we realize that we've gone off on you know, a train of thought. And um, so we can, use our reason <clears throat> as well which can be really helpful to, to reason that these states don't really lead to happiness not in the long term and they're actually reinforcing habits which are um you know causing us suffering um this is beginning of addictions and things isn't it really and um if it's based on ignorance which both attachment and aversion are then it's not leading us to sort of clear seeing and wisdom and a happier sort of way of life. So although those unwholesome states might initially feel very absorbing and we may be quite attached to them, they don't ultimately lead to happiness and freedom. So the nice ones, wholesome states. Uh, so the third right effort is the cultivation of um, wholesome states. And one way you can see that we do this through the practice, because the practice develops the seven awakening factors, which you could see as the opposites of the greed, the hatred and the delusion. And they're basically waking you up, leading you to happiness, clarity and freedom. So um, those I've just remind, those seven factors of awakening are mindfulness, investigation, effort, we've done that list as well, joy, which makes it all a lot easier, but you can see that also as interest. So you kind of become compelled on a more positive path. And then there's uh, tranquilization, so there's less restlessness there, so there's less of a, a kind of compulsion to go off and find um, amusement in things that are wholesome. And then um, concentration, which kind of builds the power of the mind as well, and equanimity, equanimity, which means they were just much more even-minded. So um, the good news is that those 
wholesome factors, those wholesome states of mind are all being developed when we do the sitting practice. And we can also, really important to develop them in everyday life. Some of you may have done the exercise of fitting them to the days of the week and going through um, Monday, waking up and being aware of mindfulness on and off all day or Tuesday and then Tuesday investigation. It's just bringing them to mind um, is very helpful and noticing if there's more of one that maybe might benefit from um, at different times. Okay, so um, then the fourth one, which is basically maintaining wholesome states once they have arisen. Now, in a sense, we become quite expert at this when we practice, because you may well have an experience of starting the practice with the counting, with the following, and you know, all being a bit clunky, everyday life still being quite close by, concerns, it not really quite lifting off and flowing at the beginning but then as the practice goes on it starts to develop maybe a little bit of a life of its own it maybe starts to kind of flow a bit you start to feel some good feeling and it's a little bit like I always think um, going sailing so at the beginning you've got to drag the boat across the beach and then you've got to get all the ropes right and you've got to work out the wind speed and the direction and get it all set up. But then there's a point when you're out on the water, um, when I have to admit I've really done windsurfing, not sailing, but you, it just scuds, you know, and it just goes. And at that point you have to change your effort. So when you've you know, developed your wholesome state, let's take the example of the practice first of all, so maybe there's a level of concentration and mindfulness which is there. And you can really ease off the effort and let the practice do you to an extent, you know, let it work on you. So basically, that's, that's one that we consider around um, the practice itself and how we kind of maintain skillfulness in the practice. And, but also it's quite interesting thinking about everyday life. Because, and this is where maybe an awareness of, of um, impermanence starts to come in. Because things have habits, <laughs> is their nature, to keep changing. You know, we see that in the practice as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll, try and, we'll try and maintain the wholesome nature of the recording. <laughs> it's a tricky thing, this, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think wholesome states in everyday life are quite an interesting one because situations change. And um, sometimes you, you, so for example, if you imagine generosity, you know, sometimes you may get a lovely spontaneous moment of generosity. You know, so you offer to do something, okay? I'm thinking of an example when I offered, uh, a friend rang me in distress and um, spontaneously said, of course I'll pick you up from the airport um, now. You know, uh, I knew it was gonna be two or three hour round trip. Um, it was a beautiful sunny day and I was in the middle of doing something else but you know, it was just, it, that bit was easy because that bit came spontaneously um, and maybe that's the fruit of previous work one has done you know you have some level of generosity from practice that you have done however then once one starts doing the deed it's not always quite so easy you know in fact when I picked up my friend she was a little bit on the grumpy side really it wasn't it wasn't quite that we had a wonderful chat all the way back <laughs> she was actually quite quite grumpy really <laughs> so then sometimes a different amount of effort is needed um, that you have to perhaps bear in mind you know remind what I did was I kind of reminded myself of the benefits to her and reminded myself that I had committed to doing this act and you know it had to be seen through and tried to do it with a good heart and actually it's an opportunity because when it's a bit more difficult I think you learn a lot more and it stretches you a lot more um, that initial impulse of generosity was probably from previous you know just previous stuff that, that we all have that people are wonderfully generous in, in the summer to us you know, again and again uh, and then it's that maintaining which can be the difficult bit because things start to maybe wane a bit now what i thought i would do was show you some examples based on gardening 
because, um, as you know, I'm quite fond of the garden at Green Street and um, quite like doing some gardening. And I think this explains it really well because in a sense, um, the mind has to be either wholesome or unwholesome at any one point. There has to be either an unwholesome or a wholesome state. A bit in the same way that in a garden, you're not going to get empty soil for long. Um, something will come there. And if you don't plant beautiful flowers, you will get weeds, basically, um, because they're hardy and they develop much more easily and they're a bit more like the unwholesome states. That if you don't put some effort in, then the, the common or garden default state will be more on the level of um, unwholesomeness because that's basically easier. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, a couple, a few pictures. I hope this works. Um, so, um, Richard, I'm just going to unmute you. Can you see that slide? Yeah, that's fine. It's fine. Great. Okay, lovely. Great, I'll assume that's working then. Okay, so this, what I'm showing you here, is um, some bare soil with um, quite a lot of old roots, because this is a piece of land um, that hasn't really been gardened properly for a long time. I, I just moved here about a year ago, and the previous person who lived here hadn't really done much gardening, I don't think. So there's um, lots and lots of old little roots, and you could see this as maybe a little bit like uh, when someone comes to practice and they've just let they've had a lifetime of just letting their mind kind of go its own way. <laughs> it's not really, there's not been a lot of kind of cultivation deliberately going on. And um, so what I've done is there is I've, I've cleared the ground, but I know it won't stay like that for long um, because that, that isn't of the nature of things. You don't, things don't just stay still. So um, I'm just going to put on the next slide. Now, um, so that first one, I should have said, was a bit of the nature of if you're going to stop things from arising in the first place, if you're going to stop unwholesome states arising, I'm just going to go back to it actually, then um, you have to guard against them. And um, you can see probably at the top there a little weed just starting to come. Um, and if you're a good gardener, you notice these things and you deal with them and you stop them coming. Now, um, I had to do a bit of abandoning the other day because I had some really um, quite old and ugly geraniums that had, I'd had, I'd had them quite a few years and I was actually quite attached to them, but they really weren't very nice. And I basically decided to abandon them. So what I did was I, chopped them down and put them in a bucket. So that is my unwholesome plants, my rather ugly plants abandoned. And I had to I say I felt a little bit sad about it because they they've been with me a long time, a bit like some unwholesome habits. You know, sometimes when you give up things that you know aren't good for you, there was a bit of sadness around it actually. You know, it's a bit like well it kind of served me well for a while. It's been there for a long time. Now um I was lucky enough to go shopping the other week and find some lovely little geraniums, which I had in mind actually I might uh, grow on and take to Green Street. And um, I thought it would be a really lovely project over the summer to put them in pots and grow them and see them kind of flourishing. And there's something very beautiful about this. It reminds me of um, when you feel that there's something wholesome growing inside you and um, it feels like little shoots and there's kind of something healthy about it but it's also quite vulnerable and it needs kind of protecting and looking after um, but certainly um, if these things start to flourish then it will become easier to not have the unwholesome states because they will take up the place that the unwholesome states would have been in and then I have to just show you my window so now with the, the new plants that I'm going to have to maintain. So it's a shame there's not seven of them <laughs> to represent the factors of enlightenment. But I must admit I'm getting a lot of pleasure from um, the early days of maintaining these lovely little 
plants that are on my windowsill. And I realised after I'd taken the picture that actually um, it's quite funny that there's a whole load of menacing looking weeds outside the window. So even when you manage to develop wholesome states, it's worth remembering that actually the unwholesome is never that far away. <laughs> and you have to keep your window shut and um, nourish those um, wholesome plants. So um, I'm going to just take that back off. Okay, so um, I thought before we did a practice, it might be nice to have a bit of um, question and answer. So um, if anybody's got any. Yes. Okay. Okay, I was just wondering, is there no in-between state between uh, what wholesome and unwholesome states? Is there no neutral stage between them? really good question actually that I'm not sure that I'm completely sure of the answer does anybody can anybody help me out there is there such a thing as a neutral mind state which is neither wholesome or unwholesome I think there might be actually but I'd quite like someone to back me up on that one <laughs> Jackie. Uh, Jackie. yeah I think uh, my understanding is I mean perhaps that it's not a black and white thing that there's degrees of wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. So something that could be just a little bit wholesome or a little bit unwholesome. So that might be what you might experience as neutral. That's one suggestion anyway, as mm. something that might, you know, work with how one experiences these things. Mm. But you say it's true that there's always a level of ignorance there because we're not enlightened that there's always some ignorance behind i guess so <laughs> but then is there ever a wholesome state in that case That's a bit, yes. well actually i remember asking something like that of um, a monk um last year and he did basically say that the whatever the there is things like latent greed, hate and delusion, somewhere at the back of or beneath all even skillful states until one is free from them. But, you know, I guess that's just how it is. So, um, yeah. I suppose it's all a bit relative, really, isn't it? Yeah, but they're still hugely different from each other. You know, something very wholesome and something very unwholesome. Definitely different kettles of fish. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I come in with the thought? Mm, yes. <laughs> um, I can't remember what sutra it is now, but the one that talks about karma with a dark result or karma with a light result or karma that neither has a dark nor a light result. So maybe the uh, neutral states would fall, maybe some room for exploration with that. So obviously the karma with dark result is clearly the unwholesome, the karma with light result. Uh, the wholesome, but what, you know, what are these, what is karma without a dark and a light result? So, um, but I can't remember the name of the sutra right now, but <laughs> something with mm. exploration perhaps. <laughs> I think a lot of the time it's quite hard to detect whether it's wholesome or unwholesome. So for example, if you're just um, going about your day, you know, doing some jobs, getting some things done, is that wholesome or unwholesome or just somewhere there may be slight attachments there, there may be slight versions, but then there may be slight wish to provide for others that seems quite wholesome. A lot of the time it's kind of bumping along, like so maybe quite light result pull is what you're thinking, that sort of those kind of activities, which is not really particularly heavy harm always. Yeah, perhaps it's a bit like when with mental health, it's all about kind of categories or dimensions. You know, it's not that you either are depressed or you aren't depressed. There's a whole dimension of depression or anxiety. And it's a bit like that with the wholesome and unwholesome, isn't it? You say if you're doing a bit of housework, mm. it may be moderately wholesome because you're taking care of things. But it's, you know, um, or it could be mixed, couldn't it? <laughs> it depends what state you're doing your housework in. At least Maybe you're not thing. harming anybody either, exactly, are you? Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But perhaps thinking of wholesome and wholesome on a bit of a dimension from you know minor to, to more major. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I was very interested in your statement about when you went to pick the friend up, she was actually quite grumpy. 
sometimes one commences a skillful act that one believes to be simple to, to be skillful so you offer to help somebody and they turn around and say i don't need your help and all you've succeeded <laughs> yeah. in doing is making them angry yeah. yes. so we, we don't know the karmic the karmic result of anything that we do until we do it and although we may have great intentions it doesn't always turn out to be skillful and i was quite interested in how, how did how did the story with your friend actually end up did she I mean, end up getting over being grumpy? <laughs> yes, she, she was actually very, in that case, I totally agree that can happen. In that case, she was actually quite grateful to be picked up. She did need the lift, <laughs> but she wasn't in a very talkative state of mind. Um, <laughs> so when I tried to ask her how her holiday had been and how she was, you know, and things like that, she wasn't, she wasn't very um, friendly about it. <laughs> but I think the actual picking up was a good thing. But I suppose that's, it was interesting because I, Maybe part of my generosity was I quite wanted to spend an hour talking to her, but yeah. that was an assumption. And when you give, you need to just give, don't you? Yeah. Uh, not be thinking, what am I going to get back from that? Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So that meant that then I had to do sort of a little bit more work and just, you know, um, just accept it for what it was that at least she'd had the lift and she really did need it because she wasn't in a good state of mind and she needed just to get home fast really yeah just following on from that last bit of discussion um is it really true that um the the, the result that the, the the important thing that matters is the wholesomeness or otherwise than of the intention since you can't predict the result it's like um you know the issue of killing living beings it it seems to be largely a matter of the intention. If you tread on an ant accidentally, then presumably that doesn't have a huge karmic result negatively because there was no intention. It's very different from a deliberate act of killing. So I'm not quite sure that I get this. You have to wait for the result before you know whether the original thing was, you know, can't know, was wholesome or unwholesome. To me, it seems more like it's the intention. Yes, I think I, th I think mm. that's true, and I, th I think it it's more what I meant by that example was that one thing seems to follow another quite often, in quick succession in general. That as soon as you maybe that's great, you made that generous offer, and then suddenly you're in a new new situation where you have to find some other reserves or work in a different way. And life just like that continuously, isn't it? Including in the practice, you know that um, <clears throat> you know one situation changes um maybe you start off i don't know doing some housework and it's all straightforward and then suddenly the neighbors are making a really loud noise from next door and you feel quite cross so you have to you know develop some patience and it's just changing all of the time isn't it i don't i don't think i think it's very hard to know what the um calm effect is but often with a wholesome state there's a certain kind of taste isn't there it actually i think that's one thing you get to know over time i don't know if other people agree there's a kind of a taste to when things are wholesome, there's a kind of cleanness to it, um, which you don't get when there's attachment and aversion and a lot of ignorance. Yeah, yeah. Did they say that you should not even give Dhamma talks or talk about Dhamma talks if the other person really doesn't ask or want to know? Uh, how, how far you can go with that? So mm. you must Mm. Well, it is said, isn't it, um, at the right time to the right person, the right things. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I'm sure we probably all had the experience of, um, for example, saying, oh, I'm going on a meditation retreat this summer. And people just don't find it interesting. It's like you just said you're going, I don't know, to play tennis. If they're not interested in tennis, they're not going to be interested in it, are they? And then they won't ask. And yeah, I don't think people will hear if they're not interested. I don't think there's any point or I don't think it's even helpful because um, it won't have that kind of freshness for them um, if they come across as Dhamma when they genuinely want to know. Um, I don't know. Is that, is that the sort of thing you were thinking of, Vasanta? Yes, even if we, we feel that they will benefit. You can't force things on anybody. You can't even suggest. Mm. Mm. yeah it just doesn't doesn't go in does it 
Um, in fact, it can even have a negative effect because it might even turn them off Dhamma for the future. What is well, mm. I was just going to say, um, in a sense, the four right efforts, you could see them really as around developing habits and abandoning habits which are not helpful and are unwholesome. And in the same way that we see with other habits, it's said that 21 days to um, develop a habit, such as if you took up running or something, um, or eating in a particular way, it then becomes quite easy because it becomes second nature. And I think it's like that with, um, in like, um, abandoning unskillfulness and i think the practice makes you much more kind of sensitive to the things that don't feel right so it starts to jar much more if you have a sharp word with somebody it really hurts you you notice that much more and that helps you to um want to turn away and kind of cut off those kind of habits and at the same time doing the practice looking at these things, turning them over in your mind, keeping good company, such as your good selves, whether it's on Zoom or in person, it has, has, a, has an effect of you know, producing wholesome qualities um, and also to develop a liking for their taste. You know, that um, it just becomes the way that you are. And then if you keep, um, encouraging that and just noticing the good feel of it uh then it'll start to come more and more and just kind of stay with you more and more so um that was about all i was going to say really um it's really i think an area that one lives with and works with um but one thing that can be quite useful is to think okay there's there's these four different ways of, of putting in effort there's guarding, there's abandoning, there's cultivating, and there's maintaining. And quite often this kind of, you could be working on the wholesome or the unwholesome at any one time. Um, but I think it's just a really nice way of understanding what effort's about, because it is one of the ways that we, it's not one of the things that just kind of comes, it's something that you do actually have to do. So it's worth being conscious of and, um, giving consideration really, a, a, a brilliant area to investigate. Thank you. Well, I will do a blessing to finish and um, wish you all a really lovely rest of the weekend. Bawata sapa manga lang ra kantu sapa dewata sapa sata nubawe na sada soti bawan tu te Bawa tu sapa manga lang ra kan tu sapa de wata sapa dama nu bawe na sada soti bawan tu te bawa tu sapa manga lang ra kan tu sapa de wata sapa sankhanu bawe na sada soti I want to take.